Hey everybody, welcome back to Bob Key TV time once again for the broom wagon and a lot of ground to cover this week. Tons of racing. We got the good, the bad, and the ugly from all the racing this week. Of course, the neutral zone news, Orica Scott in the headlines discussing their rosters for the Grand Tours. We're going to get into that. They got a lot of cards to play. Must be fun to be on Orca Scott. Musette Musings, of course, everybody's favorite topic. <laughs> And I love how heated people get about this. Disc breaks back in the headlines. Sidewalk shooting in the Umloop Het Nuiseblad up in Belgium. And of course, you want to stay tuned for this. One of the best tweets of the week of all time. All of that coming up on the Broom Wagon. All right, everybody, let's get straight into the racing, the, the tour of Abu Dhabi down in the Middle East. Um, first chance of the year for the big three uh, sprint talents, Cavendish, Greipel, and Kittle to square off in a stage race so far this year. Stage one going to Mark Cavendish. That's the good. The bad, though, unfortunately for Marcel Kittle. Crashing out with just over a kilometer to go, and we're going to get to this in the disc in the music musings about the disc brakes. Owen Duell also involved in that crash with Marcel Kittle, and uh, a lot of controversy stirred up by that. Uh, stage number two, Kittle back on the good, getting the better of uh, Caleb Ewan. To the bad, <laughs> he started to celebrate too early. Maybe the most basic rookie mistake to raise the hands in celebration, and then. Oh no, <laughs> Kittle just coming around and barely getting the better of Caleb Young. But that's a remarkable ride for Marcel Kittle to have crashed at high speed. I think Mark Cavendish hit 75 kilometers an hour or 74, right around there. So Kittle probably not going a lot slower than that when he hit the deck and uh, was able to get up the next day and win the stage. So uh, absolutely fantastic riding. But Caleb Ewan redeemed himself on stage number four in the rain. How often does it rain in the desert? I don't think it rains that often down there, but a uh, rainy day, abysmal conditions, and Caleb Ewan smoking Cav and Andre Greipel. Uh, Kittle not there in the top ten in the sprint, um, but you can't take anything away from Caleb Ewan on uh, that particular day. And it begs the question, is this guy the real deal? Is this guy going to compete in the Grand Tours for the stage wins in the sprints? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> yes, he will. Now, I don't know if he's going to do the Tour de France this summer. He's just 22 years of age, so they might wait a little bit longer for that. Uh, but if he does do the Giro or the Vuelta, I'm sure he's going to win some stages in the Grand Tours in the sprint stages. Uh, also in the Abu Dhabi Tour, the GC. An incredible field of GC contenders for the Tour of Abu Dhabi. Um, Quintana was there, Nibali was there, Aru was there, Contador was there, Romain Bardet was there. None of them, however, could beat Rui Costa. And I think the clear and obvious reason for that, besides the fact that Rui Costa is a great bike racer, former world champion, um, was that his team, new team, uh, uh, new sponsor anyway, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, and they just signed up a new principal sponsor, uh, lead sponsor in Fly Emirates, which is an airline, I believe, based in the Middle East. And uh, so Rui Costa, a little bit extra pressure. And the bad part for the GC guys, though, marking each other while the race went up the road, Ilnor Zekerin, Tom Dumoulin, and Rui Costa up the road. But Contador decided he would mark Quintana and Nibali and... He would mark Aru, and Aru would mark Romain Bardet, <laughs> and Romain Bardet would mark everybody. Consequently, uh, not competitive in the overall standings for the win. So uh, strange riding by uh, a lot of the GC contenders, and our first chance to see a lot of them. Quintana, in, in all honesty, seemed to be the strongest, put in the most uh, difficult-to-manage attacks. But Rui Costa, very clever, understood that the big GC superstars, uh, just uh, just mentioned, uh, would be watching each other. So he went out a long ways from the finish line, six and a half Ks to go. He made his attack and uh, um, brilliant win for his sponsor uh, where the race took place. So big win by Rui Costa. I don't think he'll be able to rest easy for the rest of the year. I'm sure they want to get more results, but starting off great for Rui Costa uh, in this season. 
Um, also in the racing, it was opening weekend up in Belgium, but first, <laughs> this is uh, something you will only, you might only ever see this in Belgium. One man taking on the man. <laughs> One man taking on the man, uh, paving some of the, the cobbles. Um, uh, and this individual decided he would try to, um, I mean, it's pretty remarkable what he's trying to do. He's trying to scrape the the actual tarmac over the cobbles. And I'm imagining it's on one of the famous climbs featured in uh, the Belgian hilly classics and semi-classics in the springtime, like Tour of Flanders, for example. Um, it just... Uh, <laughs> He's got a rake, and I don't know, a long knife. <laughs> the road worker not impressed by this man's efforts. He must love, it's so ridiculous. Oh, I just love it. <laughs> I wish I had been pedaling by there at the same time. I would have had uh, some choice words to say to the <laughs> I mean, you gotta feel for the, the municipal worker. He's just trying to do his job, but uh, uh, a show of defiance from Belgium. <laughs> uh, moving on, Umloop Het Neuseblad. Great win, defending winner of last year's race, Greg Van Avermaet giving BMC Another fantastic win uh, by winning this semi-classic, the opening uh, weekend in Belgian racing. Uh, he beat Peter Sagan, the current world champion, and Sepp Van Mark. Sepp Van Mark having a very good day. And Sagan also had been a long time since Peter raced and uh, did well to get second in that. You know, Greg Van Avermaet gets a, a snifter of the finish line. Very, very tough to beat. Uh, but Peter Sagan raced very well and would go on to rectify that the next day. We'll get that in a second. Also to the good, Lucinda Brand from the Sunweb women's team. Uh, dominant performance, soloing to the win in the women's Umloop Het Neuseblad. The bad, however, Tom Bonin caught behind a crash. About 60 Ks to go, big pile up, very common. Um, bad luck for Tomeke. Uh, he did have a tough high-speed crash just a few weeks ago in the Tour of Oman. Uh, doesn't seem to be suffering uh, from that crash, uh, luckily, for Tom Bonin and the rest of the classic season. Um, but the next day in Kuren, Brussels, Kuren, he was unable to start because of some stomach issues. But Peter Sagan was not to be denied the next day. And Peter Sagan destroyed the field. It, when he, well, watch him open up his sprint here. <laughs> And, uh, of course, it's been a very tough race for many kilometers. It was Sagan himself that uh, lit up the finale and uh, put a big distance between himself and the other sprinters. And once he opens up the sprint, there's no way. And it just absolutely throttles the other riders in the breakaway with him. And gets his first win uh, for uh, the Bora squad in the Rainbow Stripe. So... I can, I can safely surmise that the rainbow curse is long gone. P, you know, Peter Sagan he's, he's, he is a truly brilliant bike racer. And I want everybody to watch Peter Sagan racing um, as often as you can. And in the years to come, we'll be looking back on Peter Sagan's accomplishment with awe and reverence, hopefully. I'd like to show you... <laughs> Peter Sagan's um, interview, uh, it's, uh, and Peter Sagan has had some uh, interesting interviews, but this one, this one is just, I mean, this is just crazy. It's, a, it's so strange. It, these pregnant pauses, um, and believe me, I have interviewed a number of, of uh, professional cyclists over the years, it's not always the easiest thing to do. Um, 
you have you have to find a balancing act. It's a really delicate balance between um, asking uncomfortable questions and then, or maybe going over line and being critical about the rider's uh, performance. So. This is one of those. Peter Sagan, uh, Sagan the sprint, the line the moment had been when crossed. You, um, went wide in that curve. Was that the moment you lost today? No. Oh. Because you went really wide there. Eh? You had you had oh. some problems. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's understandable for the interviewer to wait for more than just no <laughs> as a response. And so he gets into even deeper trouble, <laughs> which is also perfectly understandable. And you can feel Peter Sagan's frustration starting to increase a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Uh, not every day I can win, right? I work, uh, yeah, a lot before. We went to the finish in the first group and then, uh, you know, uh, I didn't have legs for a uh, bit, uh, Greg, yeah. Because there is a problem with your health, kind of. Huh? Your health, you have a health problem. Health problem? Which? <laughs> this is uh, not exactly a question. Uh, and if I was... <laughs> and like I said, there's probably a language barrier. And in Flemish, the interviewer uh, might have asked differently. Is there a problem with your health? I'm not saying that <laughs> you have a problem with your health. That's a very different uh, uh, circumstance. But Peter, stomach, stomach problems? problems uh, uh, no, I don't I think, think so. so. Why? Why? Because, because they, they told, told me, me a couple of moments ago. <laughs> There's another thing. Um, when the interviewee asks the interviewer a question, <laughs> the the balance of the exchange is totally thrown off. So then the interviewer says, somebody told me that, and this is classic. I think uh, it's normal for the people if they go on the toilet or not. No, it's no problem, it's okay. <laughs> All right, um, it's good to know that Peter is not suffering uh, any health setbacks, so <laughs> uh, I love hearing Peter Sagan's interviews. He's, a, in all honesty, very intelligent and um, has uh, an exceptional understanding of uh, all of the people's uh, overriding circumstances and he brings that to the sport every day he rides. And he's so talented that he can actually think about what's happening and how to solve problems as spontaneous situations um, unfold. So he's well aware in the finale, like he was on uh, Umloop Het News about what Sam Var Sam, uh, Sepp Van Marke's uh, motivation and his story is, and same with Greg Van Avermaet. So uh, it makes him very, very tough to beat. He's won 90 races as a professional now. Uh, he's 10 years younger than Alejandro Valverde, who just won his 100th race. So <laughs> but I think he'll be into the... Uh, uh, the triple digits before the end of this season. You heard it here first for 100 wins, so he needs 10 more <laughs> and he'll be there. But that's very, very doable. Um, also, Tour of Provence, a small stage race in the Provence region of France, won by DMC rider Rowan Dennis. So that's the good. Tour of Langkawi, Travis McCabe from the United Healthcare Squad, uh, American professional getting the best of the sprinters again in this early season. So Travis McCabe on great form and winning big sprints against the best. Volta Alentejo, I believe is in Portugal. Uh, Logan Owen won a stage number four there. And uh, he's joined on the top step of the podium by his wife, Chloe Digard Owen, who just won a World Cup pursuit individually in the UCI track. World Cup in LA, so the Owen family on fire. <laughs> All right, everybody, next up, the Neutral Zone News. All right, Neutral Zone News, Orica Scott in the headlines. They have told the world what their grand tour plans are. 
A lot of cards to play on the Orca squad. They have the Yates brothers, Simon and Adam Yates. Adam Yates fourth in last year's Tour de France. And they also have uh, one of the revelations of last year, Colombian superstar Esteban Chavez. And Chavez was on the podium in both the Giro and the Vuelta last year and will make his Tour de France debut. Um, it's tough to support more than one leader. So the team has decided that Chavez will debut in the Tour de France and uh, has a great chance, considering the course, to do very well. Uh, Simon and Adam Yates are going to go do the Giro, but then all three will do the Vuelta. And the question is, is this a good idea tactically? And I think it's a brilliant way of using the resources that the team has. And the Orca squad is maybe the best in the business at that, getting the most out of their budget, getting the most out of their riders. I named them Team of the Year last year because of that. And uh, it's very clever for Chavez to debut in the Tour de France this year because Chris Froome is the preemptive favorite, uh, the probably one of the most overwhelming favorites in a long time to win the Tour de France. So it takes a little bit of pressure off of Esteban Chavez to perform at his best to try to win. And considering his pedigree, that's not uh, out of the question. So to debut in the Tour when Chris Froome and Team Sky will have the responsibility of uh, defending the title they won last year, and all of that entails all of the tempo making, all of the pressure, all of the media scrutiny, I think it's a great tactic to take Chavez this year, see how it goes, see how he can do in the Tour de France, and in years to come, have a great chance of winning it. Uh, it's a very strong field in this year's Tour de France, uh, but because of Chris Froome's preeminence as a favorite, I think it's a great idea. Uh, Adam Yates, fourth in last year's Tour de France, to improve on that this year would be very challenging. So better to send him to the Giro and the Vuelta, see what he can do in those stage races, and then maybe have a two-prong attack in the years to come with Chavez and Adam Yates. Simon Yates, great talent as well. Uh, so Orica, I think they're going to have a very successful Grand Tour season. I don't think Esteban Chavez will get on the podium this year, uh, but in the years to come, he most certainly has the talent to do so. But watch for him to win a stage in the mountains. So that's my prediction, and <laughs> that is the Neutral Zone News. Uh, all right, everybody, up next, we got a humdinger <laughs> of a music music. Going to get into the disc break ongoing controversy. All right, and see you in a second <laughs> in the Musette Musings. All right, in the Musette Musings, disc breaks back in the headlines. Let me set the scene. Um, Abu Dhabi tour, stage number one. Marcel Kittle and Owen Duell of Team Sky, Kittle of Quickstep, get tangled up with just over a K to go. Um, both go down. Uh, neither seriously hurt a number of other riders. As you can imagine, at the front of the peloton when there's a crash, a lot of guys uh, get involved in it. Um, when Owen Duell got up, he noticed a clean slice right through the top of his shoe. And... Uh, uh, after the finish, Owen Duell uh, said his shoe was cut from the disc break. Um, the next day, Marcel Kittle, out of respect to the safety of the other riders, uh, stopped using his bike with the disc brakes on it for the rest of the race. Um, but what happens next? <laughs> this is... Now, whether or not... And if, you, if we look at at the shoe, uh, and this is a tweet from Alex Dowsett, uh, team, uh, excuse me, Movistar Pro Alex Dowsett, former hour record holder. Thankfully not a body part, dual shoe, and bear in mind there was just one bike with disc brakes in that crash, uh, which is instructive in this uh, because Marcel Kittle was the only rider with the bike with disc brakes. Um, that's not a definitive proof that the disc brake caused that. When we look at the videos, when we look at the videos, it's almost, it's, it seems wildly improbable that his left shoe, which is on the other side of the bicycle, so Owen Duell to the, to the left of Marcel Kittle when they collide, um, and 
And so how that disc brake got over, <laughs> over the bicycle, but I've been in plenty of mass pileups. Uh, I don't want to say how many, but more than 50, probably less than 100. But before, the, before you have a chance to come to a stop, it just, they're just body and bikes just flying everywhere. Um, it's quite miraculous that there are not more serious injuries um, considering what is transpiring when there is a massive pileup. Um, and last year during Paris-Roubaix when we had a similar uh, situation and uh, uh, one of the riders uh, <laughs> leg was sliced open uh, much to the uh, uh, unbelieving <laughs> uh, general public, uh, the UCI took the step to ban disc brakes at that time, uh, which I thought was a good idea. Um, one problem with this whole discussion is this is the main problem. Whether or not uh, Owen Duell's shoe was cut by Marcel Kittle's um, rotor from his disc brake or the barrier that's very possible also a lot of very dangerous barriers out there we see that all the time also the main thing and what's most disturbing is that the cyclists themselves uh, their voices were not comprehensively taken into consideration and Adam Hansen the CPA rep and CPA is the um, Professional, professional Cyclists Association that uh, is trying, the president is Johnny Buño currently, uh, trying to give the riders a collective voice. And uh, that's also a big part of the problem. In professional cycling, you don't have two teams on the pitch against each other who can both have a representative and come to a consensus pretty easily. You have 22 teams um, out there uh, and that makes for a very difficult <laughs> you can have um, you know a quorum or a popular vote um, but very tough to get a, a cohesive clear 100% agreed upon strategy for the uh, health and well-being of the riders Adam Hansen was the representative on on site um, he had some choice things to say uh, and he said a lot of riders are concerned and worried about it, and they just hope it's not the disc break. So Adam Hansen uh, saying that if it's some other part of the race course, that's much easier. That's a that's a debate that is uh, much more um, easy to have an agreement upon, and that's the safety as far as the barriers go for the riders when they're charging down at high speed in the sprints. This is also. Uh, what Adam has to say. There's been a lot of communication be between the UCI and CPA, which is great, especially since last night, obviously, <laughs> because we're not sure if it was or wasn't disc brakes that caused the tear to Owen dual shoes. So at least they're speaking about it. Um, Chris Froome also weighing in. Uh, he says basically the same thing. The riders' voices should be heard, and it's discouraging that they're not, especially when it's something that relates directly to their health and well-being. If a, This is what Chris Room said. If a hot blade like that cuts an artery, then a rider could be in big trouble. I hope that we don't get to that point before we stop and take stock. And a uh, very rational way to handle it. Um, there's been some videos <laughs> of uh, uh, people trying to get the rotor to go and see exactly what they'll cut through. And uh, I believe it's Velo News has a, a pretty interesting one with a piece of chicken and it looks like some ham hock of some sort. <coughs> right straight through that, uh, which doesn't take into account the, the shoe that they tried to cut was a much more difficult, but that doesn't take into account Marcel Kittle plowing into you. Um, the inertia of uh, uh, Marcel Kittle going at full speed. So not a definitive um, video by any stretch of the imagination. Not 100% not scientific, but when you see what it can do to flesh, uh, it's pretty compelling. Um, I think 
that a cover over the disc brake and everybody in the Peloton has the same equipment can't be that hard. <laughs> How hard can that be? Um, let's agree to that until the point where that can happen and everybody's ready for it. Don't allow disc brakes to be used. Then we don't have any other discussion. So that's two things. Covering the brakes uh, and the, the weight of the bike, it, they can be so light now without sacrificing the safety at all. It can't be that hard to have a cover, piece of plastic over the rotor. Uh, very common technology in motorcycles, so it can't be that hard to translate that to bicycles, especially at the highest level of the sport. Give the engineers from the bike companies a little bit extra work. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody has to be on the same technology as far as braking is concerned. And like a lot of riders have said, the contact patch on a bicycle is what is as or more critical than the ability to slow the machine down. And so uh, all of those things should be considered and a trial period um, in some of the smaller races in the early season would be a great place to do that as long as everybody is on the same technology. Alrighty, enough of that. Write in, please comment. Uh, the last time we talked about this, <laughs> a lot of acrimony, uh, a lot of vitriol. Um, uh, I'll tell you this though, before you write in, think about the safety of the riders. Keep that in the forefront of your thinking and use nice words, okay? <laughs> Just the opinion, thanks a lot. <laughs> Sidewalk riding at the Oom Loop. Uh, there's some talk about finding the first three men. And this, this, is, uh, this is what happened before the race. The UCI said absolutely no riding on the sidewalk. No taking advantage of smoother pavement. You have to stay in the middle of the road where the cobbles are uh, on those sections of the race course. Which is maybe the stupidest rule they've ever come up with. If there's some smooth road and you're with two guys and you have a clear view of it, there's no spectators, uh, there's no barriers in the way, you're going to use it. You are suffering like an animal. Uh, every pedal stroke in those situations, when the race, a semi-class is exploding to pieces, are incredibly agonizing. And for the UCI official to sit there behind his desk with zero empathy and just say, you can't use these stretches of pavement, is maybe the dumbest thing I've heard in a long time. If you have a barrier that prevents the peloton from using those roads, no problem. But if you see that, you're gonna use it. Now in Belgium, uh, using the bike path when you're in a bike race is against the law a lot of the time. This is not what I'm talking about. Uh, to improve your position by using parts of the road that they wanna discourage riders from using because there could be spectators, uh, there could be automobiles, um, but on the cobbled climbs, when there's a smooth rain gutter, and you don't have a barrier over that, the riders are gonna to gravitate towards that. So some riders, uh, especially the first three, seem to have taken advantage of those sections of the road to the chagrin of riders that did not, that were trying to follow the instructions of the UCL officials. But I think that's one of the dumbest things they've done in a long time. So if you don't want the Peloton to use those smoother sections of cobbled climbs, you have to cover them somehow. And <laughs> you can't just disqualify the first three riders uh, two, three, four, five days a week later or find them. Uh, that's just ridiculous. So uh, UCI has dropped the ball on this one once again. Whether or not the outcome of the race would have changed, you have Van Avermaet, Seppe Van Mark, and Peter Sagan in the front. Um, I don't think anybody from fourth backwards would would say that that is the case. <laughs> uh, if so, I haven't uh, seen their comments yet, but if they do, I will most certainly update the uh, broom wagon Musette Musings if we do have that. All right, everybody, please comment and please <laughs> be civilized about it. <laughs> and uh, next up is the Tweet of the Week. Tweet of the Week, like I said, one of the best ever. Uh, this is Bernie Eisel, Dimension Data. Very dangerous for an errant water bottle to be flying through the peloton, but watch this kick, like, bing!
Wow, that takes some foresight and it takes some concern for the other riders around you, which is in too short of a supply for the most part. Uh, pointing out obstacles and uh, keeping even your competitors safe is a big part of the allure of cycling, uh, what makes it enjoyable. Uh, so hats off to Bernie Eisel, adult beverage of your choice, Bernie, on me next time I see you. <laughs> uh, a lot of times you get around an obstacle and you are in the clear. You forget about all the people around you. So let's point things out and let's try to keep the group just as safe as we, we can. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. Um, follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Comments, please. Keep them coming. I love. Them. I read them all. Uh, try to get to. I try to respond to as many as I can. Um, and uh, thumbs up are greatly appreciated. To subscribe, click on my face. To get some merchandise, click on the T-shirt icon. Until next time.